So I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today for this funeral mass for my father, Alan Joseph Kirby Jr. My mom made a comment last, last night after the wake and she said that we saw all the different historical parts of my father's life as different people came to visit. We saw historical friends from the past, new friends, friends from Columbia, friends from St. Joseph's, newer friends from Our Lady of Grace. And so we thank you for being here. I want to thank my brother priests who in the midst of a busy holiday season are able to be here as well. And I wish to express deep gratitude to Monsignor Harris who jumped through a lot of hoops to, how us, to let us have and to be able to have this funeral mass on December 23rd. So Monsignor, we thank you very much. Dear friends, we assembled today for a multiple different reasons. First and foremost, to praise and worship God, to keep our focus on God. And then in the midst of that praise and that worship, to bring our sorrows and our broken hearts to him and to offer supplication. In these prayers that we offer, we ask that God grant eternal rest to my father and to give consolation to his family and to all those who loved him. Our time together is not an empty time without focus or purpose. We are not here merely to celebrate a life, but rather to offer worship and supplication to God. So that spiritual work depends upon the truths of our faith, upon the paschal mystery of Jesus Christ, namely of his passion, death, and resurrection. And we need to remind ourselves and remind each other of this saving truth, that Jesus Christ, the long-awaited anointed Savior, came to us and redeemed us from the kingdom of sin and death. He freed us and restored us to the love of the Father. He conquered sin and death and opened the gates of paradise to those who love him. And this is the central mystery we celebrate today, the mystery we rely upon in order to offer this worship and to lift up our supplications for our loved one who has passed from this life to the next. For dear friends, Jesus Christ is Lord. He is victor and he is risen. We join our cries to that of St. Paul who proclaimed, O death, where is your sting? O death, where is your victory? Thanks be to God, we have received our victory in Jesus Christ. It is a victory that we can have confidence in. It is a victory that, while fulfilled now in the life of my father, was already playing itself out in the twists and the tragedies and the joys and the triumphs of his life. As that same central mystery, the Paschal mystery, wants to play itself out in each of our lives. Born in Chicago, my father principally was raised along the border towns of Massachusetts, Massachusetts and New Hampshire amidst the poverty and the brokenness of those old mill towns. The family moved every few months, depending on when they were evicted. His mother abandoned the family when my father was a small child, and his single-parent home was dominated by an abusive father. There are stories of shocking neglect and utterly disturbing abuse throughout his entire childhood. In response to such evil, my father cared for his younger siblings and oftentimes purposely took extra beatings in order to protect them. He labored, accepted the sufferings of this life, never saw himself as a victim, and he looked and labored for ways in order to make situations better. In environments seemingly without hope, he saw something beyond the darkness of his world. In his own way, he trusted and relied on the sense of divine providence, of God's mysterious care for each of us as children. My father always believed that things could be better, that the brokenness outside did not have to become the brokenness inside. In situations that oftentimes breed ongoing cycles of poverty and abuse, my father chose to be the difference. He didn't accept the lies that pervaded his early life. He didn't believe that he was useless. or that life was terrible, or that evil things or easy things were the solutions to the sorrows of life. Well, he may not have ever formally composed the principles of his life, his way of life showed what he believed. He chose to accept the hidden 
and oftentimes disturbingly passive, power of virtue and hard work. He believed that while we cannot control the fallenness of this world, for bad things will happen, we can control what we do with it, how we respond, and who we become because of it. Many Westerners today live in comfort and have not truly experienced the full horror of our fallen world. There are, however, some among us who have experienced it, who have been hit by the proverbial and the literal two by four, and many times have become its victims. Regrettably, it more oftentimes happens that the pattern of darkness overwhelms its prey and the cycles of evil continue. But there are, however, every once in a while those shining lights, a person a person who breaks free. The freedom does not come from unexpected concession or entitlement or some indulgence. It comes from a heartfelt decision to do good, to fight for goodness, and to accept all the attacks and the hardships that come with such a clashing countercultural choice to do what is right and to avoid what is evil. It's easy to think that the choice to do good will somehow result in worldly benefit or will profit us in some way. Such results, however, only ever happen in artificial worlds. The real choice, which hits the pavement of life, is to accept to do good for its own sake. It is the joy choice to be a good person because we want to be a good person. The real choice is to be willing to choose and to suffer for what is right and good. There is a grace in doing good, knowing that the world will still be fallen and that bad things will still happen, but to still labor and suffer for what is good. In a world that hounded my father to be bitter, to choose a perpetuation of evil, and to wallow in darkness and self-pity, he chose to do better to break the cycles of poverty and violence that surrounded him, and to rely on God's divine providence to drag himself out of the cesspool, to be for others what others never were for him, to make a contribution to society and to serve the common good. We see the power of God's Paschal mystery playing itself out here in this life of this one believer, we see the passion of the Lord Jesus Christ in the life of my father. As I pray, we also see it in our own lives. My father's conviction to do good empowered him to enlist in the United States Army when others were trying to avoid the draft. He was willing to go to Vietnam, although he was never sent. I'm grateful because I was born a year later. <laughs> Instead, he served in multiple units along the east-west border of Germany and the north-south border of Korea, guarding the country he loved and protecting the freedoms he cherished. While his greatest military accomplishment was being named the first sergeant, an honor that is recognized by any veteran, his greatest work and his most endearing labors were those that involved his marriage and family. My father didn't know what husbands and wives were. He never knew them or even what parents were supposed to be. He had to figure it out, and his tools were sacrificial love and hard work on one hand, and mentoring and a demand for excellence on the other. He and my mother, who were together, who were together since they started dating, when my mother was 14, had to weather the storms of life and figured out married life together. And after almost 50 years together, I think they figured it out. <laughs> married at the tender ages of 17 and 19. They've been together for some 50 years. Life was not always good to them, but they were always good to each other and to their children. My dad was unlike some fathers since he had a clear understanding of his vocation and his duty as a father. 
namely, to prepare his children to fight the fallenness of the world without letting any of that fallenness into their own hearts, to strengthen them with determination and a love for justice, and to teach them to pursue what is right, to never give up, to never fall prey to self-pity or victimization. The lessons of my father were never done. As Alzheimer's disease struck and sought to steal his tenacity and his hope in God's divine providence, my father was unmovable and dealt with such a terrible disease with the highest sense of fight and of goodness. And he even was able to preserve his sense of humor. Alzheimer's did its best, but it was no match against the soul with such a fighting spirit and the grace of God. As we observe the Paschal mystery, we move from the Lord's passion to his death, and so was my father. This past week, my father, the believer and the fighter, concluded his passion. After using even Alzheimer's disease to teach us, he concluded his life as nobly as he had lived it. He died with dignity, with love, and with a family that despite all odds, he and his beloved wife built and formed together. And so we move now from the passion and the, and the death of the Lord to his resurrection, and so with my father. Growing up in the military, my father would oftentimes go to a new assignment ahead of us. He would prepare things, and then we would follow after. So my father has received a new assignment and has gone before us. After whatever purgation the Lord deems just, he will, please God, enter the beatitude of heaven and share in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, receiving all the rewards for those who love God, who have fought for his kingdom of truth and goodness, and who have relied on him in the darkest of moments and the most dire of situations. And so, Dad, and so, Dad, we thank you We thank you as you receive your eternal reward. You are already sorely missed, but we know that God is with you and that you would dwell with him forever and that you are preparing a place for us so that where you have gone with the Lord, we may one day follow. <laughs>